So good morning, everybody. 3.35, so we need to start. And uh, uh, let me just remind you uh, to fill uh, possibly with today uh, the form for the composition of the big lab groups. Uh, so that uh, uh, this evening we can collect uh, all submissions uh, and check uh, uh, all the availability of the preferences and we can publish uh, uh, the composition of the two groups uh, at 8.30 and, uh, and 10 uh, o'clock in the morning, starting from this uh, Thursday. So that we can start already at the beginning with the, with the, the final schedule. Okay? Uh, we can still have may, maybe some minor <coughs> adjustments later on, but let's try to, to start, let's say, with a, uh, with a good starting point. Hmm? I remember you that the composition of the group should be three or four people. If you don't want or then are not able <clears throat> to create a group or to join a group of this size, uh, you can do the big labs. You can do the exercises by yourself, but uh, the, we, won't, we won't evaluate them to give the, the score. Okay? So because this is also an incentive for working together and for attending the the labs. So that's why we insist uh, on having three or four people per group. Okay, but just was the uh, we will let you know by tomorrow the composition of the of the two groups uh, uh, in the lab. Okay, so today <clears throat> we are going forward with our uh, basic knowledge of JavaScript, and uh, we'll start uh, by analyzing, say, the next step uh, from. Uh, uh, the exercise that we did uh, uh, last week, on Thursday, um, we worked with simple data structures like uh, uh, arrays and strings, uh, and now we try to um, play a bit with objects, basically. Okay? So we try to put together and uh, uh, try to apply what we learn about objects and functions, for the moment, the simple parts, uh, into a very simple exercise that will grow uh, in, also in the next few, in the next few weeks. Uh. So basically, the idea here is uh, to create uh, um, a simple data structure made of an, an array of objects that uh, and these objects will contain information about uh, these functions. So basically, information we're going to store also. I need to be close to the computer because the mic uh, is still not working in this room, so I need to record the audio with the computer. Um, me, uh, the, the, the each exam should be should consist of these uh, five attributes: the course code, the name, the number of credits, uh, the score you got, uh, and uh, a date. Okay. So let's start simple, and then we can make it more complex, like uh, maybe uh, having the the score, and the date uh, as optional attributes, because maybe you want to record uh, the courses that you still have to pass or whatever. But for the moment, we just start simple. Okay. Um, so. The, the suggestion here is to uh, create a function called exam to create uh, a new exam object, and then a function called exam list for creating and managing a list uh, of these objects. Okay, so quite standard, say, object-oriented design. And uh, we try to see how to do it uh, with, uh, with JavaScript. So maybe let's start with creating a new file. Uh, Exam. Hmm? Dot js. Okay, uh, let's uh, give more space to this. Okay. So uh, we have, of course, the use strict statement, and we can start defining you know, a function for creating exam. Uh, we know two types of functions, regular function and constructor function. They are mostly equivalent. So the, the creation of an object using a constructor function will be something like this, function exam, with some parameters that we are going to fill. So that this parameter will be the code, the name, the credits, uh, whatever, uh, the um, score and the data. And we are declaring a normal function. By convention, we are using the capital letter as a for reminding us that this should be used as a constructor function, use the, the new keyword. 
Okay. And in this case, uh, we inside the body of this function, we uh, can and should use uh, the this keyword to refer to the object that we are creating right now. Uh, so, for example, this dot code, we are setting some attributes on the this object uh, equal to code, and then this dot name equal to name. This dot CFU. Yeah, I'm not doing any validation here. We could do that, but it's not the focus. Four and this dot uh, date equal to date. And I don't need to do any return statement here um, because implicitly a constructor function always return the this object that we are creating. So I'm basically initializing the value of an object. In this case, I'm initializing the object with only string or numerical values. So there are five attributes, uh, all of them. I, I don't know what the, the real type of this object, but uh, let's say they are normal values. Hmm? Uh, this is one possibility. And in this case, uh, we would call this function Remember to call this function with the new keyword. Okay, we call it like uh, const uh, exam equal to new exam, and then we provide the parameters. So the code is uh, 0, 01 ABC, and then the name is uh, whatever, course, and uh, credits uh, 27, and the date. Uh, the string for the moment uh, 0308. So this would create a new object called my exam, calling the constructor function, and it will return this uh, basically result. Um, let's have a look. Um, that's what happens here. If I run this code, I will note that was sprinted by this log statement. Okay, so the representation of an object with the different attributes that we set. From this moment on, this is an object that I can use on my own as I prefer. Hmm? Another possibility could be to use a normal a regular function. Hmm? So, for example, function create exam with the same parameter list, but not a special constructor function. That's why I use the lowercase letter in defining it. Yes? No, you cannot return. So the question was, uh, if I do, I do some checks here, and I don't uh, uh, want to create the object. Uh, so what, what should I do? Uh, no, it's too late. Once you are in the body of the constructor function, the, already, the object has already been created. Okay, it's not that the new operator cannot return anything. That it doesn't happen. Okay, so you could throw an exception if you want, or just use a normal. Or just use a normal. But I mean. Don't fight JavaScript, okay? Don't try to make JavaScript behave as if it were Java, okay? It's a different programming model. It takes a while because, it's, mm, but we, we shouldn't actually try to force, otherwise you're you are really, really fighting for every statement because the behavior is different and you, you can really not reproduce that, uh, the behavior of, uh, say, uh, protective, uh, uh, um, strong type languages. So let's try to, to embrace it rather than fighting it. Okay. So even right okay, now we are not doing any okay any uh, validation here. Uh, but for example, what happens if I would create a simple function like uh, return object, and inside this object I set the same 
parameters. Name, CFU, score, and date, date. So what, what we are doing is a regular function, normal function, where we are just creating in line an object with some specific attributes, and we return it. That would work that mostly in the same way. So creating an object that doesn't require defining a class or really defining a, a constructor function, it can be a convenient way of doing that, but it's not a required way. You can just create objects out of a curly brace. You don't need anything more. So it's very common to just create objects on the fly when you need them. Of course, you need to be more or less consistent with the, <laughs> the set of properties that you put into these objects. But there's really nothing that binds you uh, to really use all the same properties. So I could uh, duplicate this and say that this my other exam is another exam which has a different code, 8, 9, XYZ, use the scores, get a lot of those, or that it's uh, 29 and maybe it would be next week, next month. And we can print, print the content of the other exam, and it will work mostly the same way. Oh, sorry, I, it's not new exam, but it's create exam. It was too similar to the other one. Okay, so what we see is that the same type of object has been created with the same attributes. There's only one slight difference, that the first object in some way remembers it was created by the function called exam. And the second one is just a, a bare object, a next object. There's nothing special about the function that created it. OK? Uh, apart from this, the behavior of the two objects are, are exactly the same, because they have the same properties. OK? Uh, this remembering the, you know, the function, the creator, uh, is a quite a Say complex stuff in JavaScript has to do with the, the so-called uh, prototype chain. So basically, in JavaScript, there is no inheritance, and there is no instantiation, as we saw, because we are no classes; we only have objects, and these objects are linked uh, to each other by a linked list uh, of, of references. Basically, no? it's called the prototype chain of the objects. We'll devote some time at analyzing how this prototyping, let's call it prototype inheritance, works. Uh, which is a quite special way of doing that. And this is the effect that we have that in, in some cases, uh, an object is linked to another object uh, at creation time. And this can be useful because if we can add some properties to this function, these properties are automatically accessible to all the objects created by this function. But I will stop here because it's a longer as a topic than what we need to know now, okay? So there is some additional complexity here that may deserve having a, a bit of trust like this. But from our purposes of the exercise we're trying to do today, there's actually no, no visible difference. Okay, we we'll use the first four, maybe it's because it's nicer, but just remember, you cannot use new with a normal function, and you call, and cannot call a constructor function without the new keyword. Hmm? So that's why, that's why the capital letter will remember us uh, uh, how to call the function. About, uh, let's do a parenthesis about the dates. Uh, right now, for date, I just uh, use a string. For yes, sorry. Yes, sir. Can you repeat that, sir? How can we understand that the function of is a constructor? Okay, uh, we 
the function is a, is a constructor function because we, it's assigned to this. So it must be called as a constructor function. In, in a normal function, uh, this would be, again, this is another composition in, in JavaScript. But it, there are four special cases about the behavior of the disk keyword. Uh, basically, what we understand is that this is not uh, created by the function. It's created by the new keyword. So when I call in a function with a new, this call new injects a new object called this into the function. And then the function can use this in this way. If I try to call this function without a new keyword, this would be, um, I would like to say that it, this would be undefined. Actually, it's not undefined. It would point to a global object, so it's, uh, it's even worse. Um, but uh, uh, it would not have the correct, it would not represent a new object. Basically, okay. So they they need to work hand in hand. There is nothing in the function definition from the syntax point of view that will tell me it's really a constructor function. There is no. There are, uh, these constructor functions are not a different kind of function. Are regular functions used in a specific in a specific way, where inside the body I'm using the, this object and I'm relying on the color of this function to use new to create the object for me. So it's a cooperation between the color and the function. Syntactically, they are the same. Um, that's, we only use the convention about the capital letter just to help us not to make mistakes. I, 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 I don't know if I answered your question. I know you're not satisfied with the answer, but it's not my fault. OK? <laughs> that's how it works. Um, OK. Um, Let's spend some time about the dates. Hmm? So I, right now, I just store the date as a string. So uh, OK, it could be one possibility, low level possibility. But then you see that the exercise uh, will ask me to do some comparison about uh, the dates, finding sense with a given date before or after. So I could ask myself whether there is any, say, object uh, uh, that is able to handle dates, uh, handle comparison, and, uh, say, arithmetics. Uh, and oper uh, various operations with dates. Hmm? And uh, if we go to the last chapter of the slides of last week, uh, it talks about a bit about the dates. Uh, and basically, what these slides say is that uh, there is a, a, an object called date in the standard JavaScript library, and don't use it. Because, because it has a lot of problems. OK, basically, it's not very consistent. Uh, and uh, the parsing and the uh, um, printing of the date values is dependent on the language of the machine you are on, depending on your time zone. So basically, it's uh, unpredictable no? to, be, to be kind to it. Um, and there's, there are no arithmetic, arithmetic operations uh, over date objects. Mm -hmm. So usually, people try to use different libraries uh, to handle dates. Uh, these are maybe half a handful of possible um, libraries that you can uh, use uh, um, for, for handling dates. Uh, one very famous one was the so-called moment library. And that was a lot criticized because the download of this library was very large. It was a, actually a huge library for a small topic. So a lot of people started to bash this library and say, OK, don't use it, don't use it. And so the people um, managing that got angry and say, OK, so we won't support it anymore. Or stuff like that. Okay, uh, The open source world is strange. And so another, I think a couple of guys um, published this other library, Date.js which was more or less compatible as an API with the moment library, but uh, therefore it was that it was very, very small. Mm -hmm. So it took over some way. There are other possibilities, looks on day functions. This function is useful because it actually extends uh, the, the predefined date object. So it's a more compatible with the standard library. But we, we'll see some examples with the, or we we'll try to use the, the DJS day, day library mm -hmm. just to we are not fond of dates. Dates are always ugly to, to handle, but it will be uh, um, a chance for us to see how, how we can import other libraries into our projects. Okay? So uh, 
basically, okay, it's a, it's a library for random dates. Uh, we have uh, this website that will tell us all the functions, all the, so where's the website? Okay, with some documentation about uh, uh, this library. But first of, first of all, okay, if this library is somewhere, how can we import or install or uh, access to these functions from our code? Basically, uh, this depends on the environment where you're running your code, whether you are in the browser or in Node.js. For Node.js, we, okay, if you are in a terminal, basically in this directory, we only have uh, our file exam.js don't look at that okay and so how can this file in a way access the function of the library node as a system for managing the dependencies of a project for managing the um, libraries accessible to a project okay and so we and these the dependencies of a project are managed by a tool called npm Node package manager and PM. So if we need to use some libraries in your project, you must first first initialize the dependency manager with the init command. NPM sorry, init. It will initialize your project by creating a couple of files with that they will contain the list of dependencies and a folder directory that will contain copy of the dependencies you download. Okay? So npm init, it will ask you some, you some stupid questions, like the name of the project, uh, the version, description, and not. OK, the answer point, I don't care. Just took the wrong one, but we don't use it hmm? for the moment. OK. Is it OK? Yes, everything is OK. Uh, we could also do npm init minus y to say, okay, tell yes to all the, the, the questions. So, what did they do? npm init initialized a new, let's say, project, npm project inside the current directory, and it creates one file called package.json. Package.json is some information about the project. It may contain some scripts, so a way of, of launching your program. Right now, we are just launching Node and the name of the, of the program. Maybe we want to launch it with different uh, 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 options uh, in debug mode, in normal mode, uh, by setting some variables before, and so on. So we can define some scripts uh, for activating our project. It's not the, our focus today. But everything is in, is in here. The information about this project is in this file called package.json. Okay, right now, nothing changed in this folder, only the package.json was created by the npm init. I, I use, just use the command image to create it, but you could also just copy this file by yourself. It's just a normal uh, uh, file in JSON format, okay? You know about JSON, the JSON format, some JSON means just uh, JavaScript object notation. Okay, so it's a text format for representing object uh, using the JavaScript syntax. So it looks like a JavaScript variable, uh, sorry, a JavaScript object, open brace, closing brace, property, colon, value, comma, and so on. And if I have a, a, a nested object, uh, I will create another brace and so on. So we are using the JavaScript syntax uh, for describing an object to basically create a text file with some properties inside. Okay, just a uh, very convenient syntax. Uh, the only um, exception to the JavaScript object syntax is that the property names must be in double quotes. So no single quotes and no just identifiers that in JavaScript are perfectly legal. JSON is, has a very simplified parsing uh, syntax, uh, and so that's why there's a lot of restrictions. But if you take this and <clears throat> For example, you could cut and paste it into a JavaScript program. It would be legal JavaScript for creating an object. So it's a very, uh, it's a format which is used very, very often in, in the web. And we'll, we'll see it a lot. 
Okay, once I have this project initialized, I could uh, install the libraries that I need. So there is an, one big uh, repository of packages from which NPM is able to pull the libraries that we want uh, by name. So, for example, the uh, documentation of this JS uh, say, tells us that we should install a package called DayJS. So npm install DayJS. And what it did, it was to install added one package. Okay. So practically, what did it do? It modified the package.json. You see that now it contains one line called dependencies. It was not here before. So it will list all the dependencies that we have installed up to now. And it created a folder, node modules, that contained a DJS folder with all the JavaScript for this library. So basically, every time we install something from, N from NPM, from the Node Package Manager, we are adding a dependency or more, de or more dependency, maybe. In ma this is a very simple library. More complex library will pull a lot of trend, transitive dependencies. So I, I need a library that depends on another one, that depends on another one, and PM will download everything. Okay? Um, and all the dependencies will be listed here. And will be downloaded into the node modules folder inside your project. So just remember if you are uh, like I'm doing a uh, version in your project using Git, uh, always ignore in the Git ignore file, ignore the node modules uh, uh, directory because it grows huge mm -hmm. and you really don't need it. Um, I could also remove the node modules mo uh, folder because it's not really part uh, of the project. The project. Uh, all the information about the project is inside the package.json. So if we want to transfer our project, uh, we just need to transfer the source files and the package file. And if you want to recreate and redownload all the library, you just write npm install. And it will read this kind. We're not installing anything new. It's just an install command. We are, it will read the package.json file and download the library, recreate the node module folder. Okay, so every time we add in something, we are installing something, we'll list a new dependency here, and these dependencies can be used anytime for recreating all the libraries and for redownloading all the libraries. Okay? So these are the three basic survival commands uh, uh, with NPM. There's also another file that was created, packetlock.json, that uh, actually has some more details information about the version of, of the different packages. Uh, the issue is that uh, in some cases we want uh, to install the latest version of every package, uh, but in some other cases we want to install the exact same versions of the packages, because maybe in the meantime I developed one project and the libraries uh, have changed uh, and I'm not sure I didn't test it that my program with the newer version of the library, so I want to, you know, to fix it, to lock the version of the library. And so the, the while the package.json file lists at least version 108, 108, which is the version I, I have today, uh, uh, this is recording the actual version that has been installed. Of course, they, they are identical at the moment, <laughs> because I just installed it. But if DJS will update something, uh, if I install it from 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 uh, from zero, it will uh, use this version because it's, it's being locked uh, by the package lock file. So if, if you just want to reinstall with the la latest version, you just delete it from the lock file and then reinstall it. Hmm. Just basic uh, package management uh, issues. Okay, once the the uh, File are there. Once the libraries are installed, we need to use these libraries from our code. And again, in the uh, Node.js uh, system and in the browser, unfortunately, the comments are 
are a bit different. Um, in Node.js, there is one function called require that will load one uh, package and give me a reference to it. So require sorry, um, needs a, a parameter, which is the name of a library. It will read the JavaScript file containing the library and will return me a reference to some variable, some object uh, created by this library. And they can store this reference uh, into one library into my code. Okay. If, if it looks like a lot like a function call, it's because it is a normal function call, basically. So we just execute the code and return. This code will return a reference uh, to an object uh, that we can use to call other functions to, to, to refer to the different functionality. Okay, so right now in our code we have a reference to the DJS object, and we may create uh, right here uh, this uh, object DJS that is being returned by the require statement. Uh, is actually a function. So we can call this function in different ways, or we can call the properties of this function in, in different ways. This function will create objects of type DJS. Hmm? And we can have all these uh, properties for all these methods. So for example, if we want to create a new date with a parsing, by just calling DJS without any parameter, we'll create a new object uh, from the current date, from this current moment. Okay? Um, so, just as an example, console.log DJS with no parameters, it should print. Uh, an object here, you see, it's a, it's a strange, it's a lot, it has a lot of properties with all, all the internal properties of the date objects, uh, representing the current time here, March 8 and 9 of 7. Okay. And then other, all the other properties internal to this object, which is called M instead of, uh, of the date of the JS. If we pass a string to this DJS function, we will construct an object with the current date, or the date we specify as a string argument. So maybe we want to uh, 0308, and we will create an object uh, or today at midnight. I only specify the day and not the time, so it's being set up conventionally at the beginning of the day, and so on. And once I have these objects created, I can uh, extract all the possible, so I want to get the, the day, the month, for example, you have a month method, I have, you want the day, I, I have a day method, and so on. So they are all methods for reading for adding, subtracting quantities of time for the dates, for comparing them. For example, here in display, we have a, um, a difference method that computes the difference between two dates or two instances of time, and so on. So the basic method for manipulating uh, this data type, just remember, uh, that all uh, that these objects are immutable objects. Okay, so once I create a DJS data, that cannot be changed. It means that all the method for setting uh, this is called they are called setters, but uh, actually, for example, we have a month method 
that works uh, as a getter and acceptor. So without the parameter, it will return the current month. With the parameter, it will set, we will change the month of the object. Actually, it will not change the month of the object because the object is immutable, but it will create a new object with all the attributes equal to the current one except the month that has been modified. So every modification will always return a new object with the modified values. Okay, it's quite common in JavaScript to have this behavior. And this overloading of the methods where the same name, I don't have get month or set month. We have just a month, and depending how we call it, I'm being reading or writing uh, this, the attribute. With writing in the sense of immutable objects, so creating a copy with the modified value. Okay, but this just uh, uh, some very simple library. You can uh, see them in your document, the documentation when you need it. So maybe we want to store the dates uh, here, not as strings, uh, but as actual objects. We, we may decide whether the, con the constructor function already requires an object to be best, uh, or it just is happy with a string, uh, and so we'll do the conversion itself. Uh, probably it's uh, simpler. So we convert it to an object so that it will be easier to operate later on. Hmm? And the same is here. Date, date, yeah. So we are taking this, the, the, the string and converting it to an object. So that inside the, 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 the created objects, uh, we, have, we will have proper dates. And okay, we see we have this <laughs> M object where we don't have the strings anymore. We have this uh, uh, representation of an object inside. Uh, Inside our exam. Um, just a trick for debugging. Uh, once we are in the console here of the debugger, of the um, node uh, debugger, uh, we, we see what you print, but we cannot expand, we cannot drill down because the program is already finished. Okay? There is one trick. There's one, one statement which is called debugger. So if you put a debugger statement into the JavaScript code, and if the code is running in debug mode, it will activate a breakpoint here automatically. And so if you put it as, a last, as the last instruction, the program will not terminate after the last instruction because it will be stuck in the, to the breakpoint. And from the console, we can inspect all the variables and the, uh, all the running values of the program. So right now, with this debugger statement, I press the run and debug at 5. And the program will run as before, and then we stop here. The execution of the program has been stopped here. We see here is the console for debugging, stepping, and so uh, restarting, and so on. And now, since the debugger is alive, you see the, the orange line below here, uh, we can expand the object that have been printed, because this console is interactive when it has a program to interact with, so when the program is still running. And so we can see the properties of the day, hour, month, year, and so on of our uh, um, date. So it's a good trick because otherwise we are printing something and may the, the printout here is shortened by the, the console because normally you can expand it, but to expand it we need to uh, be able to stop the program. So I will usually use this trick. And then when you finish, you can stop the debugger and the program is terminated. OK, so what do we want to do with this uh, um, exercise? OK, we created the constructor function exam, and then we can define uh, another object. We call it exam list for managing a list of exams. Right? OK, and it's not difficult to do that. We just apply the same pattern with a, with a twist. Function, create exam, create so exam list. Initially, it doesn't need any parameter as a constructor because we create an empty exam list. And of course, this object needs to store to remember an array of exams. So inside the object, 
we have one property. In another language, I would say a private property. But here, I, I just only say property with the XM list. Which is an empty array, initially. And then, and then my, I must add methods for operating with this object. The methods are defined on the object, not on the class, the dog driving class. So it means that, for example, the text asks us to do one add method for being able to add an exam to the list. Okay, how can we write it? What is a method? Is a property, a normal property of an object, whose value is just a function, happens to be a function. Okay? So this dot add is nothing more than a function that takes one parameter, a new exam, and does something with that parameter. And using the error function notation. Okay? So what I'm saying is that I'm creating a function, arrow, with a one parameter. I call it exam, and some body of the function itself. This function is a functional expression. The value of this expression is stored into the add property of the object that they've been creating. Okay? So that means what that whenever I call the add method, I'm executing the body of this function. And the body of the function does nothing more than add into the exam list, uh, push. This is just an array, so we can use the push method with the new exam object. Okay? So there's no real difference between properties and methods. They are all, they are all attributes uh, or properties of an object, some of them have a, a value function. And so we can call them. This function, you see that as in internally uses two values, two variables. One is exam, it is its own parameter. One is this. This is not a variable inside this function. It's not an object inside this function. It's an object that I borrowed from the enclosing function. Remember, we mentioned the concept of a closure. This function remembers the reference to this function by itself. It doesn't have any this object, this pointer, this variable. But it will remember that this from the enclosing context. And so every time we call add, it will add to the specific list belonging to the object that has been created with this, with this specific invocation of the function. Remember, we are, we are going to call, we may call exam list many times. And every time we have a different list. And every time we call the add function that will add to the specific list. Okay, um, so we can try to call these functions. Okay, let's create, uh, let's comment previous logs, uh, const uh, my exams. Oh, so I don't want to call everything like this, so all my exams. Is a new exam list. And then I can add to all my exam, for example, the my exam one, just one, and uh, all my exams that add uh, my other exam. Of course, I can create one of the old on fly. Add 
new expand with all the parameters. So like six. So we are populating away this other this list of exams uh, using the um, add method. Of course, right now we could also do something very wrong, like uh, all my exams uh, add uh, two. There's nothing that prevents me to add uh, some object of some value that has nothing to do with the list of exams. It will fit into the array and not doing any checks. But let's not do that. So if we run this, we can inspect. So we are stuck in the debugger mode. So I didn't print anything in the console, but I can inspect the values just by hovering them and see that this, all my exam, you see that on top is uh, an object created by exam list with uh, two properties. Exam list, which is an array with, of three elements, and add, which is a function. And if I examine the exam list uh, property, I see that it's actually is, is an array of length three with item 0, 1, 2, I expand item 2, I see the properties of item 2. Actually, what, what, what do we expect? Nothing more. Hmm? So it's working very good. OK, so this is how we create objects with methods. There's no special syntax. It's just how functions work. Um, okay, I, I'm not telling you this. Okay, uh, another, just another example. The second point say, okay, for example, I want to add a method for finding a course code. So, giving a course code, return me the exam object uh, corresponding to, the, to that code. So that's easy. This implementation, we just need to iterate. So this dot uh, what's the name? Uh, find is a function. So you can use the arrow notation, or you can use the function notation. is exactly the same, but better to use the arrow notation. Uh, we receive the code as a parameter, and in the body we can iterate over the content of the array and return the element uh, that has the same code. So for uh, let exam of this exam list, this is not optional, like in Java that you will because mm, having a local variable or having a property of this object are two different issues. Okay, so if we are using the constructor function, this should be always specified. Otherwise, it would be an undefined variable. So we iterate over the uh, element of the list, and if we find one exam whose course code is equal to the parameter that we received, then we can return it. Remember the triple equal. Return exam. And we don't find anything, we can return undefined. Or if you just don't return anything, it will return an, uh, undefined as a default value. Yes? You can use the function of array. Sorry? The, the fine function of an array, uh, yes. But uh, how can the fine function know about uh, which which field to, to, um, to compare? 
the in, in a way, the find function requires one object to be compared with the content of the array. Okay, so if we were an array of strings, I can pass the string, I can pass, or, or a number, I can pass the number. But this is an array of objects, so I should pass in the objects whose content is equal to one of the elements of the array. So in that case, it would mean that I already have all the all the all the information. Okay, so we'll see in a moment uh, a way with the filter method, not with the find method, uh, for doing this work, because we actually have to explain what is the criteria for matching. Okay. Um, okay. So this is a simple code, a simple uh, JavaScript code for looping and uh, and checking an array, like uh, okay, we were writing in C code. I iterating, I'm uh, iterating the control of an array. And the same goes for the other points. Uh, uh, for example, returns an exam list uh, with a subset of exams after the given date. So the, this method, what does it require us to do? To create another exam list object, sorry. Another exam list object, so not the array. I want to create another exam list whose content are just the subset of exams after the given date. So I can loop over the current exams and add them to the new exam list only if the data is greater than the one that I specified. So, uh, for example, this call this method should be called uh, after date. So this dot after date is a method that takes as a parameter one date. So let's say start date and it creates a new um, Exam list we populate this exam list with a subset of what we have here so um, for example be uh, we iterate again for let exam of this dot exam list And we will check whether the date, uh, so the start date, maybe we can convert it uh, to DateJS. Start date, DateJS of start date. So that we can use the comparison methods of DJS for comparing the two dates. So I know that the, the date property of my object, my exam object, is a DJS. And the um, thing what also the start date here to be the same. And so if uh, I compare, uh, let me write it in English. Uh, are they with exam dot data is okay? Then we add result. Add this new object uh, exam, and then we can at the end return the result and be empty or maybe contain uh, uh, everything depends on the how many items uh, satisfy the, the condition. Yeah. How can we force the uh, user to enter the date for the function instead of, for example, the string or uh, integer? We are, this function will uh, require a string as this parameter, and then we are converting the string into a date here. How can we force the We cannot force the user to enter something. Uh, usually, if the user enters here some other objects or some uh, and a number or anything, the code will 
we can either, either check the code, do a lot of checks in our code, or just let's say, in this case, the JS is trying to parse a date into an object. So if I if I I'm passing something that JS can understand, the code will be fine. If I'm passing something that the JS will not understand, it will return an undefined value here, and then the program will fail. But it's, there's no way of checking that uh, beforehand, Instead, uh, unless you put a lot of checks here with the type of instance of, uh, sorry, there's no instance of here, the type of, and, and, and again, if it's type of string, it's a string, uh, what, what does this string contain? Hmm? So there's really no, no real protection here. Uh, unless you try to parse it with the library and check the result. I would, I would not check uh, the value of the start date. I would check the result of the DJS function. So if the DJS could parse it correctly, then I'm fine. Because the DJS can also parse from an array of values, for an object with uh, different properties. So maybe I, li I leave the user uh, uh, free to pass whatever parameter can be converted into a date. Uh, it's not my, I don't want to restrict the interface for that reason. And if the JS doesn't convert it, then I can check the result and uh, say stop my execution here. So it's more, you know, polymorphic. Uh, as a, we let uh, the value go until we find a place where we can process it anymore. OK, how, uh, so what is missing here, how we do the comparison with dates. Uh, we check the documentation of JS where there is some query here that does some operation. For example, is uh, same or after is the method that we want, probably. If the date of the course is the same or after the date that we're being given. And so the method is, uh, is same of after, or one object compared to the other. Um, for being a minimal, a small library, the DJS library doesn't have all the functionalities built in, but it can be extended with plugins. Mm -hmm. So what you see here is that this method, it depends on the is same or after plugin to work. So we need to install this plugin and then, and just one instruction, and, and then we can use this method. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, the, the object will not contain this method. And if we click here, it will tell us that for installing this plugin, we just require a different uh, package, which, but sorry, a different function which is in the same package. We already have installed. We don't need to npm install anything. But when we are doing the required JS, it will not read every function. It will only read the minimum, the core functions. And if we want to add other functions, we can import them and extend the DJS library with these new functions. They will basically add new methods to the object. So we just use these two instructions at the top. Const uh, is same or after. Require DJS slash plugins slash is same or after. Okay, and then did we just read this property and we extend, extend the JGS library with this. So once we do that, all our JGS objects will contain this new method. And so we can actually use it here if uh, if uh, uh, the exam date so uh, exam so that that is a JS object so we can uh, use the um, is same or after then the start date.
So let's try to test this method. Const test. Uh, exams in 2022 are the exam list are pulled from the all my exams where after date 2022 0101 and if we run it exams in 2022 contains only two exams uh, which are the ones from uh, sorry some list uh, contains the exam from uh, March 8 2022 and number one was from uh, April 8 2022 and the one that we set in 2021 has not been copied into the new object and so on just basic operations what what i wanted to show you okay is the basic working of these objects uh, but also the code that a javascript developer would never write because this is too much uh, c-like code going element by element uh, and we are not exploiting yet all the say uh, power of functions in JavaScript. Mm. Um, we we continue this exercise when we learn a bit more how to use, uh, say, a functional style of programming, which is much more common uh, in JavaScript. Mm. But we can also you know, do this, say old style procedural programming but it's not very common and it, in javascript can lead to complex code because it's not the real style and actually what we yeah, what we want to see oh the title here of this slide is asynchronous programming we'll get to those uh, uh, between Today and basically, uh, especially next week, uh, um, the, the the programming style uh, of JavaScript uh, relies uh, on a series of steps. Okay, so now we have the basic knowledge: functions and objects, how they work, how we manage them. Now we try to build on them. So the first, uh, say, programming idiom, programming style, is uh, using a lot of uh, callbacks. JavaScript always uses callbacks when it needs to do something. Callback, a callback is just a function that will be called by the object that you are using. So you are calling a method. Uh, we, we, already did, we already did that with the sort method last week. Okay. Uh, we call the sort method and we pass the function to the sort method that did the actual comparison between the elements. So it's a we Remember, we are still have the code here. The what was that? Uh, which one was it? Sort. Yeah, yeah. We call the sort method uh, that required one function as a parameter for setting up the sorting criteria. And we use the arrow notation for creating a function on the spot for, for this purpose. So this is an example, the first example of a, of a callback. I'm defining a function, I'm not calling it. I, I will pass the reference to this function to a method, to another function, to another object that will call the function when it wants, when it needs to call it. So it's a normal procedure. A lot of uh, uh, objects uh, use this method. Technically, it's nothing special. I can create, it's not just a special behavior of the sort uh, method uh, or whatever that requires a function. 
Um, for example, in this code, I define a function here, whatever. I define a second function that uh, uh, receives uh, two parameters. Creates a string using the first parameter. I like uh, to say the quote. And then it calls a function that actually is the second parameter of the fun of this create quote function. So callback is a second parameter, but we expect it to be a function. And so if it's a function, this is a reference to a function, it can be called as a normal function. In this create quote function, we don't really know which function we are really calling at this point. We are calling the function that was passed as the second parameter at the moment when the user or the programmer will, uh, called this create quote function. So I'm telling, OK, this is the quote, and this is the function for printing it. The create quote only puts together, say, the, the message and calls the printing function. Normally, I wouldn't call it callback because it doesn't have any special semantics. It doesn't tell you anything. I would call it printed or printer or something like that. The function for printing. So if I want, maybe this create quote creates a lot of uh, fancy concatenation string operations and so on, formatting or whatever. And I want to print it on the console or I want to save it on a file or I want to store it... Uh, on our display it on a web page or whatever. So the printing operation can be different. But the composition function, the co function for composing the string is the same. I only change the method for printing that will be used by the function when it needs to print something. Okay. In another object-oriented language, you would create a subclass with a print method that you would override to do different things. We don't need it to do it here in JavaScript. We just have one function <laughs> that is the specific behavior that you need. And in this case, this function, OK, I was slow in typing, and so I wrote a, a real function, and they put here the reference to this function. But 99% of the cases, this function will be just an inline arrow function, arrow expression. But this function will be defined here. Okay. This is a simple example where the code is still normally synchronous, one step at a time. Okay. For the moment, we will still work with sequential code. Then we will see at the end of today how this will start to translate into asynchronous code. So maybe the callback will be called in an impredictable moment. But the mechanism is quite simple. It all follows by the fact that functions are just references and can be passed around and called whatever I need. If I add the reference to the function, I can call it. Um, OK. The example here was the short function that we already saw last time. And this is a strange example. Uh, it could look like a stupid example because we are using an array of numbers and we are specifying the sort function for sorting the numbers. Okay, in the sort, in the format of a functional expression or in the form of, of a narrow function, I, the second one is much more readable. Uh, I just comment this because by default, the sort method will sort an array as an array of strings, even if it contains numbers. Don't kill me for that. So if you have an array of numbers and you use the sort without any, let's say, the function, comparison function, the array, all the numbers in your array will be converted to strings, and then the array will be sorted according to the string comparison. It means that uh, uh, 18 will come before 2. Because 1, 8 as a string is before 2 as a string. Hmm? Um, we didn't notice that with scores, the exercise last week, because all the scores were two digit numbers. So 
the, if the number of digits, digits are the same or in this string or there are only one digit number so the sorting order is the same but if you try to mix uh, uh, numbers with the different numbers of digits you see that sorting is wrong okay unless you specify a function that actually does the difference uh, between numbers and so it will sort this as a list of numbers so it's a surprising default but uh, we have to live with that um, this, uh, this method, say, this style of giving callbacks to functions is very useful because we can do some sort of high-level operations over our data structures and customize the high-level operations like sorting. I have a sorting method, but the sorting method needs some information from me to know how to do the sorting. Uh, another example is the filter method. Filter method is a method of, a, of arrays, so I can create an array of objects. And they want, uh, for example, this, uh, the, some companies, some the stock value, the delta in the stock values uh, of, of these companies. And we want to select only those uh, that went down in, in their values. So in this case, I would select the first and the third one. I can do that with a loop, like we did before. Make a loop and only select the ones and then store that into another array. Or I can use the method called filter that returns a subset of the current array. The subset of all the elements that satisfy a condition. And which is the condition to satisfy is decided by the callback function that they provide. So basically what the filter method does is to analyze one by one all these elements. On each of them, it will call this callback function with one parameter that is the reference to the single object. So this function, this arrow function, will be called first with the stock equal to the first object. And then I'm checking whether stock.var, the second attribute, is negative. In this case, this will be a true value. And so this arrow function will return true. And the filter will include in the result uh, the first element. All the element, not just the number. Okay. Then the filter goes to the second. It calls uh, the callback function with the, the second element as the stock parameter. The function will be called, it will evaluate uh, its body, its expression, and in this case, stock.var is 2.2, is not less than zero. The result of the function is false, and filter will not include the element into the result. And so on. Okay, so we are providing the function, this function will be called many times. When the filter algorithm is what? In the order that it wants. Every time the, fi the filter function is called, it will receive a copy of the current item. And we, we just need to decide whether this item should be included or not. All the rest is done by the filter function. Okay, so basically we are combining a high-level operation, filtering, with a customization, which is the condition for filtering. And the customization comes in the form of a callback function. This is the basic uh, of the so-called functional programming in JavaScript. And especially with arrays, which is the, the basic uh, data structure in JavaScript. Um, in functional programming, let's pick the example of the filtering. When we, do, when we want to do some filtering, we just have a generic filter method that receives a callback function which is, a, in this case, a selection function, a selector. True or false, do we keep it or not? And this is the alternative as the procedural code that we see on the right. It does the same thing. Because at some point inside, there's an if statement that must decide. But while in this style you could write the filter function once and for all, 
with all the for loops and all the ifs and all the checks, uh, whether the array is empty or not, is null, and so on. You cannot do that with that code on the right because the condition is embedded into the code. So if you need to do another filter of the array uh, in another place, you must all, have all the machinery, all the for loops, all the initialization, and so on, copied and pasted a second time. Because inside the code, we have the condition here. With functional programming, we are separating the operation from the details, from what happens at every element. Um, but tends to read more as a declarative function. Okay, do this operation on this array, and let be helped by this helper function by this callback function. Okay. It also has an advantage that this is a function call, and a function call has a result. So in this case, you have an array. I call the filter method on the array, and the result is still an array, another array, of course. And this means that they can chain a second method, second filter, or another functional method on the results of the first one. So I can write very compact code by chaining filters or functional methods on, the, on top of each other. These are functional methods because they are, they tend to be, we will, uh, not to modify, let's say, the data that they're working on. Every time I call a functional method, a method with a functional style, it will always return a new object and will not modify the current one. Okay, in order to avoid side effects, uh, in order to allow this chaining operation. So we, we must have at every step a new object and we can operate, do something on this new object without touching, without no. um, uh, dirtying the, the value of the previous object. This is very important, uh, will be very important, especially when these callbacks will be asynchronous. So we can risk uh, the value of an object to change uh, in, in an unpredictable um, uh, um, instance of time in the future without knowing that. So in order to have a safe programming, we should be in full control of uh, what is being modified by who. And a lot of functions in JavaScript are just like that. They treat objects as immutable and create new copies. It's a bit of, of course, overhead, execution overhead, because we are making copies, but uh, <laughs> it, it helps a lot for for safety. Um, so, functional programming works, uh, or this functional programming style, JavaScript is not a, a real functional programming language, but mm, a lot of uh, and the, there are other types of languages that are purely functional. But it works well uh, with these ideas because, uh, because of the nature of functions that are objects, uh, there are, no, are no special. Uh, Construct in the language where they are normal objects that can be passed, can be modified, can be combined together, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, a functional method is a function that uses other functions mm -hmm. uh, inside. So, mm, some, somebody called them a high order function because uh, it's a composition okay, of, of two different functions. And, and, but more practically, you know, what, what uh, we observe is that we can chain, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the results of different calls. Um, for making it work, as this slide says, we should try to avoid mutating the, the objects. Okay? So every parameter, we will treat it as immutable. We'll try not to modify it. We just always return a new array if we need to change to do a change in an array. Even if I'm changing only one, one bit, I will make a copy of everything. Of course, Making a copy of an array is not so heavy because we are just making the copy of the reference of the objects. The, the individual values will be of use. Hmm? Okay, so there are some uh, uh, methods, several methods that already work on arrays and have this uh, functional style. Uh, the first one, uh, we already saw the slide, but we didn't uh, read the content. Uh, the first method is a for each method. If we want to do some operation, on every element of an array, we could use a for loop, or we could use just a for each method. 
that we called, we'll call the callback f on every element. Okay, so for example, I want to print uh, the content of, uh, of our uh, exam list. I didn't, we didn't implement a, a print method up to now. Okay, let's try to do that. This dot print on the console is a function that does something on the element. So it doesn't return anything new, but it does some operation. So I could just write it like, sorry, the arrow. I could just write it like this dot exam list dot for each. And the documentation for each is telling me that I need one parameter, which is a callback function. This function receives, may receive three parameters. The first one is the value. The first, second, third element of the array, which is the key value. The second one is an index. Index 0, 1, 2, 3. If I need the position of the element to maybe decide that I want to print the even, uh, um, even position uh, elements uh, as different from the other position uh, elements, uh, I need the index value. Right. The value is just the content of the array. The index is the position. If I need it, I know that this function can receive a second argument. And uh, I can also receive a third argument, which is uh, the, the reference to the array itself would be, in this case, uh, our exam list inside the function. Okay? And this function is not expected to return anything. Okay, this is just documentation, of course. There's no type enforcement of any type. Right? So, in this case, we want to print the element. Maybe just the name and the score, for example. So in this case, we take the, uh, a function with just one parameter, so the exam, and uh, console.log, maybe just the exam name, and uh, the score. Not not name, sorry, exam.name. And exam. Is the dollar sign, not the percent sign. Okay, so I'm using string interpolation instead of doing a lot of string concatenation just to make it more readable. And if we call this method, let me go down. We can print uh, my, all my exams. Dot print. And it printed here the course and the score, the course and the score, and so on. Okay. Now I'm not very interested in the result, uh, but on the how I implemented that. Okay, so I don't have any for statement explicitly to manage. It's managed by me, and I'm already focusing on what to do on each element. Do I want also to print um, some number, one, two, three? If I need to print some number, I just use the second element of the callback function, i, and we also print uh, i plus one here. So that the printout will be nicer. One, two, three. Okay. So we know we are focusing on that function. We know which parameter it may receive. Basically, uh, the for each, when it calls the callback, he always passes all the three parameters, value, index, and array. If my callback only defines one or two, I only always do using those two, and uh, the other one or ones uh, will be ignored. So it's not an error 
I know you don't like it. I, it's not an error to pass more parameter to a function than the number of parameters of that function, the actual number of parameters of that function. So for each, it doesn't know if I'm just needing one, if I just need the value of or if I also need the index. To be safe, uh, for each, we'll call my callback always with three parameters. If I don't use all of them, I'm not forced to define all of them. Of course, I need to go from left to right. Okay, I cannot omit uh, a middle parameter of the first one. But if I only need uh, the first one, like I did before, I don't need to specify the second, and so on. Okay? So many times, uh, we, we didn't gain very much because the fourth statement would have the same number of lines. Okay? This is the, the simple case. And this does something at every element. And then we have some uh, quantifiers. So every and sum will expect a function that returns a Boolean value and returns a Boolean value whether, in the case of every, every all the elements return true, or in the case of some, at least one element returned true. So if you want to, ask, uh, to say, oh, okay, I want to check whether all the scores are above 18, I don't need to do a loop with a flag. I just call every, and the callback function will compare a score with the threshold 18. If all the scores compare positively with true value, then uh, the every method returns true. If at least one score is not greater than 18, then every will return false. And the same for sum, which is, you know, the exists at least one, okay, for all and exists. These are the quantifies in the form of callbacks. So we avoid uh, doing the, um, the, the loops. And then we have the two more, let's uh, say, uh, interesting uh, uh, function, which, is, which are map and filter. Hmm? Um, okay, let's, let's go to them. Map is the more useful one because it transforms an array into another one. So we'll uh, map, we'll uh, iterate over the array, and uh, for every array, we'll call the callback function and we'll construct, build a new array starting with the, the result value of the callback function. So for example, this callback function is taking an argument and squaring the argument, okay? So it means that I, if I applying it to a, a, an array A, it will create a new array whose elements are the square values, the results of the application of the squaring function to each of the initial values. So one will become one squared one. Two, will become two squared four, and so on. So I'm creating a new array with the same number of elements as the original one. By construction, maps all, map always construct an array of the same length. And the elements are recomputed one by one. By applying the function and storing the result of the function. So imagine I only want I want to compute the average of the of the scores, for example. Okay, if I want to compute the average of the scores, first uh, I mean I need to have uh, the scores. So I could e extract or create huh, an array with just the scores. Let's start to do the first step. Uh, this dot average. Would be a function that could uh, compute uh, the scores. Cost scores. How? 
I take the array, the this dot uh, exam list, and I map the exam list, which is an array of objects, into an array of numbers. Map. A map as a callback with a received a value, an index, and an array. The same as field. The same as for each. Same parameter. The same style. And it returns any value. Any value. The value that we want to build the result on. And what is the value? It's just the score of the single exam. So the callback will just take an exam object and will return its uh, score. So we take we are taking an array of objects and returning an array of numbers. Map exam to exam dot score. Let's put a log here just to be sure of what we are doing. All my exams dot uh, average. You see, we are printing here an array of three numbers that constitute the score property of all the objects in the array. So we are in some way going down from, from an object to a number. Right now we are just picking one property. We could do some computation of this property. We could create another type of object. Anyway, we want to put in that expression, we go into that final array. And if we want to um, compute the Average, for example, we need to. Okay, with the filter, we already mentioned that it will generate a, a, a filter and map are complementary. Filter will return a shorter array with the same elements. It doesn't change the elements, it will change the size of the array. Map will never change the size of the array, but it will recreate the elements. The you can combine them if you want. Now, for computing the average, uh, we need to create one single value that combines uh, all the existing values. And this can be done with a third the functional method. Map, filter, and reduce are the three kings uh, of the functional programming that combines all the values of an array into one single value. So it will reduce with always return one value, be an object, a number, a string, whatever I'm going to create. And how it does that is to incrementally compute the result starting from a partial value and the current value. So when you are doing the, the, the sum of, an, of the value of an array, we have a counter with a, that we increment every time you see a new number. Right? So we have a, a line of code where sum equal to sum plus value of i. This is the core. We have a partial value that gets incremented until it reaches the final value. And this increment, this updating of, of the partial value is done for each element of the array itself. So this is what reduce does. It has a callback that receives the, the partial value and the current value, optionally also the index and the array. Well, okay. And we will return the accumulated value after the last element. So in our case, OK, we have the uh, what is that? average function. We created a list of scores so we can Compute the sum of these scores. How? We take the scores, 
and we course come on and we reduce them to a single value which is the sum and how do we compute the sum okay we take the partial sum and the current value and we compute the sum of the partial plus current So at every new element that we see, okay, we already have a partial of 20, uh, 45. This score is 21. Okay, let's do what, uh, 45 plus 21, what did this say? And this will be the new partial for the next iteration. We don't do the iteration. We only do the operation inside the iteration. And of course, uh, as every, uh, what happens on the first element? What is the value of partial in the first element? We can set it at the second parameter or reduce. Uh, by default, it will be zero. So in this case, it's not needed. But it's not bad to be more, a bit more explicit. Just be careful about the, the syntax. Reduce, in this case, I call the reduce method with two parameters. One is this callback function. It's a function that itself, it takes two parameters and returns one result. And the second argument of reduce is the initial value. So it would be the initial value of the partial argument the first time it's called. And then all the next times it will take the result of the previous uh, call. And so this could probably log the number. The sum of the scores uh, would be something like uh, eight. And this two can be changed. So what they would do normally in this function average would be just to return the list of scores reduced as a sum and then divide it by the length. It. I'm chaining a map with the reduce. They are done in sequence. They may be done in sequence. Right now we are still in totally synchronous call. So it's nothing more that we did step by step before. Okay. The reduce is a bit, uh, it's not so uh, intuitive to understand because it does, it, it breaks down an operation into small steps. We won't use reduce a lot, except for computing sums or something like that, but map is used everywhere. And filter also, well, filter is easy. By the way, using the, since uh, at this point, all these functions only reduce to one single return statement, you know that the result, the return statement is not needed anymore, in even the braces. So that would be what you will find a JavaScript code for computing this average, or for defining this method. Okay, it takes a while <laughs> to be able to parse it in our mind. It could also be maybe more, more readable, like putting the reduce in the next line and something like that, or putting parentheses, but this is the essence. 
okay so we can replace this old code with this new one and the result would be i don't know because uh, i didn't write it Twenty-six point six. Okay. Um, so uh, I think we need some break right now in order to let uh, our mind digest this. Then we can do a lot, uh, like a couple more methods in our exam list just to practice a bit more. This uh, and then start uh, uh, leaning into the asynchronous programming, which is the hard topic for we start today and we finish next week. We take uh, 15 minutes of break. <laughs> 